in this edition of Colores. World-renowned artist Patrick Dougherty is known for turning simple twigs into architectural masterpieces. I think a good sculpture is one that causes lots of associations in the viewers. After three decades of making stop-motion animated films, the Quay brothers are celebrated at the Museum of Modern Art. People call them animators, but it's really the interspace between animation and film. Playwright Eve Ensler talks about her vagina monologue's legacy, her activism, and her new musical, Emotional Creature. I think the piece is really about girls, but the girl in all of us. In her underwater series, photographer Rhea Pappas explores feminine vulnerability and power. When women are underwater, they're comfortable, but when they reach the surface, they have to deal with a whole new level of reality. This program is made possible in part by New Mexico Arts, a division of the Department of Cultural Affairs, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Artist Patrick Doherty is known around the world for turning simple twigs into grand architectural masterpieces. Watch his latest project unfold on the campus of Albuquerque's Bosque School. I'm convinced that everyone knows about sticks. A part of that knowledge is from our deep ancestry. Well, don't you think it's very childlike? It's magic. It's magical. It's out of our storybooks. It's like we're having a kid's dream. <laughs> well, I think of myself as a sculptor, and you know that I use sticks and branches to as my material to work with. You know, we have a deeper resonance with it. Almost everybody knows about sticks. Kids know about it. A lot of the, uh, adults are uh, closet stick collectors. In other words, we're all hunter and gatherers in, our, in a kind of a shadow life. And our ancestors sent with us the information about this, how to use this, uh, these saplings. You know, making primitive faces is just part of all cultures. I was speaking a, a little bit about the green man and that mankind is, was born somehow out of trees and that somehow we're, our spirit is out there roaming around in the woods and, and just sometimes is personified by a grouping of leaves and limbs in which we look in and we see uh, a kind of reflection of ourselves. It's a bit like a, a certain kind of drawing style. There's a kind of a feeling of movement that's created in the surface. Come in here and you go across okay. it like that. So that it doesn't have to be too elaborate. You got the that, huh? you <laughs> it welcomes the community. You know, I mean, not all projects can you just walk in and start working on it. You know, even if you make a little change or something, he really respects and values what you're doing. I think a good sculpture is one that causes lots of associations in the viewer. So sometimes it's a childhood tree that you knew, or a bird nest that you've seen, or indigenous tribe that you've been to see or read about. You want to capture people's imagination. And uh, these big trees behind me are kind of source, uh, certainly for humanity and our well-being. The Museum of Modern Art's exhibition called The Quay Brothers on deciphering the pharmacist's prescription for lip-reading puppets takes a look at the brothers' three decades of making short films.
Quay brothers are uh, identical twins, Stephen and Timothy, born in Pennsylvania in 1947. They set up their own studio in London in 1979, and ever since they've worked together side by side, just the two of them. It's very important to think of them as these identical twins, because I feel like the space that they make comes out of this kind of magical, impossible space that only they share. The first major influence turns out to be an American naturalist painter, Rudolf Freund. I think that one of the big influences is the town they grew up in, which was a factory town where things like screws and all the kinds of things that they animate were actually made. They went to the Philadelphia College of Art. As they tell, the first day they were at school, they stumbled upon this exhibition of Polish posters, which had a major impact on them. Even though they're born in America, all of their influences are European in aesthetic and in temperament and in their obsessiveness with literature like Bruno Schultz, Robert Walzer, and the music is Janacek or Stockhausen. The Bud Sweat and His album cover was their first professional job. They presented a cover which featured the band members without heads. The studio kind of unceremoniously pasted heads on. The Quay's original design has a much more uncanny, uh, surreal quality to it. On paper, my favorite work by the twins are the black drawings but a dozen black drawings done in pencil they did in the mid-1970s when they were living in Pennsylvania. And this is work that really brings them to the brink of the transition that they made to filmmaking. There are two qualities that help me appreciate how a viewer should approach their work. One is their belief that expressive work should be a challenge. That unless the viewer goes through a process of deciphering meaning, he's not really engaged in the work. The more viewers engage in that, give into that engagement, the more fun it is. Secondly is their notion of what I call musicalizing space. The way the camera moves throughout the sets and decors in their films is a key to interpreting it. Um, it's like watching a dance. Almost all their films have that quality. It's sort of like you get taken over by the quays. It's, I call it, the land of the quay that you kind of enter into. They do extraordinary things with light, especially in In Absentia. It's a film that's inspired by the story of a woman who was in an insane asylum. She would only write one sentence over and over again, and it was, sweetheart, come, sweetheart, come. It's very important that it associates with calligraphy because they are calligraphers, and that's actually another space to think about when people are thinking about their films. They talk about their work as being more um, in, in line with the music than dramaturgy, because music is absolutely essential to their work. There's a music video that they made called Still Knocked Two. What's exemplary about it is when they're shooting a space that's neither flat nor three-dimensional, but could only be made in the cinema. It's sort of one of the great moments when they're able to affect that along with the music. People call them animators, but it's really the interspace between animation and film. It's also extraordinary because they're obviously pre-digital. And I think that people sometimes watching them now might forget they're working in these very delicate ways, but then they're, they're turning it into this incredible flow that can kind of go anywhere. 
one of the things I hope the public will take away from the exhibition is not only a better knowledge of the range of the Quay's work, but also I'm hoping that they'll be enticed to explore the same kind of music uh, and literature that's interested the Quays. It's a real antidote to the kind of relentless pop culture that we live in. This takes us a little further away from commercial filmmaking, commercial animation, and to really the avant-garde subjects. Music Steve Adubato sits down with yeah, Eve Ensler yeah, to talk about her monologue's legacy, her activism, and her new musical, Emotional Creature. I introduce you to a fabulous, talented uh, guest that we have. She is Eve Ensler. She's a playwright, performer, artist. Her latest uh, play, Off-Broadway, is called Emotional Creature. You may have heard the other uh, play that she had called the Vagina Monologues. So talk to us about the uh, emotional creature. We have a, a clip from it, but set it up for us. I'm very excited. We, um, it was, it's based on a book that I wrote. I always knew it would be a play, but I wanted to really spend some time writing the stories and getting the, the monologues down. And then we, we've had the most amazing process. We started this in South Africa with Joe Bonney, the wonderful director, and Charles Johan Lingerfelder, a fantastic composer. And we thought we'd have some incidental music, and we ended up writing songs and creating dance and video. And, and then we went from South Africa to Paris, where it became a little melancholy, mm -hmm. and added some sad songs. And then we went to Berkeley, and now we're coming home to New York. And I just have to say, it's been, for me, one of the best artistic processes I've ever had. But these girls in the play are awesome. And they're just alive and passionate and talented and fierce. And, and I was just looking at dress rehearsal last night and I just said to see six girls up on stage putting out that much talent and mm. that much thought and that much heart, it's, it's why we're in the theater. It's why we do what we do. I am an emotional creature. Everything is intense to me. I am an emotional, devotional. More than boys. Yep. Guys don't know what they're doing. We got the power! Wow. That's what is giving you this passion excitement. It is. Who are these young ladies? Well, they're all incredibly, wonderfully talented girls who auditioned from New York. They're all very young. Um, they've all been with us in Berkeley, and now they've come here, where the show has actually changed a lot. It's really gone into a new theater. And, and what I feel is happening in the theater is, um, I think the piece is really about girls, but the girl in all of us, the girl in you, the girl in me, the girl in all what? of us. Yes, you've got a girl cell in you. We all do. That part that's compassionate and alive and revolutionary and um, big heart, big openness, um, feels for the world, and has the kind of um, zeal and, and desire to make change. And I think what's happening in the play is that there's, I think it's about storytelling and hearing the stories of girls around the world and painful stories, beautiful stories, sad stories, triumphant stories. But in the end, it's really about us all seizing our hearts and, and understanding that we need our hearts. And mm. I think the heart's gotten a bad rap. I think we've all... Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. The heart's gotten I, a bad rap. I don't like rap. to interrupt, but <laughs> when you say something yeah. that requires follow-up, the heart has gotten a bad rap. Well, I think we live in a world where we believe that the brain and data and information and ideas are triumphant. And I think, of course, I believe in ideas. But I think without the heart connection, it's very hard to just very hard to mobilize change and hard to mobilize transformation. I think sometimes we're all inundated with facts and inundated with the data. And so we don't do anything because we feel paralyzed. But when the heart's engaged, when emotions are engaged, then things change and you have the capacity to move things forward. I, I don't know about you, but I bet this is true because it happens to boys at a very early age. When I was a girl growing up, I was Where? told... I grew up in, I was born in Manhattan and I grew up in Scarsdale, but I was told from a very young age that I was too intense, too dramatic, too alive. They called me Sarah Bernhardt. And <laughs> I, I didn't even know who she was, but I knew I wanted to be her. And what they were saying is, you're too much for the world. You're too big. You feel too much. Your heart's too big. Why? Why weren't they bigger? Why didn't they rise to match my moreness and my bigness? Mm. And I think with boys, 
they open their mouths and, and they have a feeling or they cry and they're told from the instant get-go, shut it down. Mm. That's not what boys do. And I think the play is a call for something else. It's a call to be in our hearts, to be emotional. You know, you've taken this bigness, this passion, and you, you've really done some terrific things other than entertaining and moving people and getting them to think. Let's talk about another initiative in the time we have left. V-Day, the 14th of February, 2013, one billion and rising, put it in perspective. Well, V-Day is a global movement to end violence against women and girls. This is our 15th year. We've raised $90 million to end violence against women and girls to go to grassroots programs around the world. And this February, we're doing the biggest action ever. Mm. On the planet right now, one out of three women will be beaten or raped in their lifetime. That's one billion women. So we're calling on the one billion women and all the men who love them mm. to walk out of their jobs, their schools, their offices, and to dance. It's Where do we be, sign up? You can <laughs> sign up on onebillionrising.org. Onebillionrising.org. And, and I, I know you can be dancing right here in the street outside Absolutely. the studio because it's really important. If you look at everything that's going on right now, if you look at the number of women being shot and raped and killed and abused in the world, and you think of how powerful and gorgeous and necessary women are to the human existence, it's really important that we stop the violence. And I am very excited to say that already 10,000 groups have signed up, 172 countries. It is happening everywhere, from the Philippines to the mountains in you know, the Himalayas to you know, Alabama. It's happening throughout the planet. I want to wish you all the best. Thank and you. Um, they were wrong when they said that uh, you were too big and that we find a way to catch up. Yep. Thank you. We need more people like you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Very Whether on land or on the water, photographer Rhea Pappas looks to capture the strength and beauty in her subjects. In her underwater series, Pappas explores feminine vulnerability and power. True. Are you flattening those flowers? Yeah. Dude, that's so awesome. I know, it's gonna look cool. Oh, it's really You're gonna look like a lily. So this is my mom, Mary Hi. Jane. She's our model and my mother. I love her. I've what? never done anything like this before. Sorry. I'm I'm excited. I'm a little, you know, nervous about it. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Whether or not she likes how she looks in it, I think everybody else does. <laughs> I'm Rhea Pappas. This is my coffee. It's so delicious. Just drink that, Rhea. Bed. Coffee is really good for you and in your tummy. I am really excited to shoot today. <laughs> I'm a photographer, on set and off set. <laughs> Time of day is very early, so it's 8:25. Um, and the reason we have to shoot this early is because the sun comes up and then makes. It's, I mean, I use a pool that has all windows, and so the sun comes in and hits the water in a very unnecessary, harsh, and unfavorable light. I've been working on this, this specific underwater project for a good year, a year and a half. I've been um, moving away from just experimenting with the water and just having fun with it, and like the awe of the first experience kind of lasted a while for me, because it's a really cool first experience, and it, it doesn't really leave that fast. I think I'm moving now towards some more interesting ideas and more conceptual ideas. My new body work is more about releasing energy, how body moves underwater and exploring underwater and what that means to be a woman in underwater. And that's been kind of the new, the new way my, my project has been going. <laughs> but I'm kind of, I think it's kind of cool that you're using an older model anyway. I think that, that there aren't enough older models that too many people focus on being youthful and. Our society is so oriented toward thin and young and gorgeous. I'm a little ripe <laughs> and older. <laughs> she is, oh man. <laughs> I, the only thing that comes to mind is Greek. <laughs> my mom is a Greek woman. It's, uh, my mom is a very playful, intelligent, talented Greek woman. When she invited me to do it, I just thought, I was a little hesitant, you know, being my age and being in the water and being filmed and everything and being a little self-conscious, but you know, I'm just gonna throw that out the window and just let it all happen. The main reason for the portrait is to talk about confidence and being a woman and how you deal with society. When women are underwater, they're comfortable and they can feel free to be themselves, but when they reach the surface, they have to deal with a whole new level of reality. 
and I have to be strong and hard. And I mean, I think that main, mainly I got a lot of that from you, whether I want to admit that one or not. I mean, you own your own business, and you've had to go through a lot to do so. I mean, we come from a very strong woman family. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Where's your car? Uh, right in front of the rat. OK. I got the keys. I'm glad you got the keys. <laughs> Ooh, it smells like a pool. Yes, it does. It's kind of fun to play with her, and she's such a good portrait taker. So, I don't know. It's just the start of the whole thing, so. Sounds good. Do you want to get wet all the way up to here? <laughs> are, you, are you feeling warm enough? OK. So I'm gonna have For to me, to put myself in my model's place is huge, and to realize that they are very vulnerable the minute you start shooting them. Let me help you get comfortable. You're going to kind of scoot down. Don't worry. It's hard for me to hear with my ears on the wall. Don't hear. You're asking them to do something that's out of their element. They don't generally do. And you just need to let them know that they're in good hands. And that's my motto. But the portrait I want you to do is exactly what we were talking about earlier. Your face and your eyes, I want you to talk about coming to the surface and being a strong, powerful woman. Got it. Whether that's hard or that's soft or beautiful, make sure not to get water on your face. It's beautiful. And I feel like they need to know that I'm there in the best intentions. I think we're good. Let's, let's go take those flowers out of your hair. <laughs> really? You're done with that? Mm -hmm. I love the scarf. I love her hair. I love her facial expression. Whoop. But you never know until you get it on your computer. Really, you don't. So this is my, uh, my AD700. It's an Aquatica camera housing. It basically houses my D700 from Nikon. It's like the most beautiful thing ever made. When I got this, I just like put it on a pedestal for a while and like, was like, all hail. And this is the beautiful dome. I love this dome. <laughs> She's having a ball right now. I go underwater with my models, and so that's the difficulty of timing. Like, if I don't go down at the right time, how am I going to catch them? Especially if you have some surface photographs, like, you know, the one next to me here with the bubbles hitting the water. If I, she jumped in the water, and if I wasn't down there and ready for her and focused, I would have never caught it. And we're going to start with just simple moves. Geometric. Yeah. You're so excited. I'm ready now. People aren't used to being underwater in clothing, let alone being underwater, you know, with a dress that sticks to your legs. There are definitely some things about experimentation with that that's a, that a little nerve-wracking. It's beautiful, but your face looks like a, is a little bit in pain. <laughs> if you are comfortable with water, I think the bottom line is if the person is comfortable opening their eyes and going under, that's a huge thing because if if they're free to do that, they're so much more free to let go of the way they work on the surface and start doing things they've never done underwater. This two, you're holding some tension. Right here, you're holding some tension in your jaw. It's, you know, like old school, like, I am upset, you know, kind of thing going on. Like, I'm being a diva. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Oh, neat. Yeah. The reason we set up the shot is because I really wanted the bubbles. I could do another one like that. <laughs> I bet you could. Move the scarf and then, and then dive underneath it. I think initially why I started with clothing was because it's unusual underwater. OK, ready? Get set. I, I'm really a woman photographer. I like shooting women beautifully. For me, I thought dresses would be the first place to do it. They flow well, they're fun, they're expressive underwater, especially if you've got all these crazy things going on. It's just amazing what the fabric does underneath the water, how it restricts my movement. What I'm afraid of is that we're gonna get too scarf oriented, that we don't talk about the movement. Okay. So maybe what we do is we literally put the scarf around you. I think at the bottom of my photography soul, I want people to express an emotion, to use their emotions and to work through them and to feel them when they look at my work. Is that hard to do? This is a workout. <laughs> People used to come to me with my book and be like, I thank you for doing this, you know? And that was really wonderful. And I, I hope that whether or not this is as dramatic as that was, that they do, they have that reaction.
and they leave uh, either feeling like they want that in their living room or that they've actually gotten something from it. Next time on Colores. New Mexico photographer William Cliff has spent years photographing the Benedictine Abbey Mont Saint Michel and Shiprock. They're really something more than nature. They're something primordial and at the same time utterly as if they were built by a great feeling architect. Pete Townsend reveals what's behind the act of destroying guitars and how his art school experiences helped him form one of the most influential rock bands in history. In fact, if, if we'd have been four arty farty art students who all thought like I did, it would have been a complete mess. Did you know opera started in parlors and small music halls before moving to the big stages? This group, known as Intimate Opera, performs bite-sized bits of the magnum opus. When I sing opera, I'm getting to the heart of who I really am. Artist David Garibaldi is not only a painter, his performance will engage you and his precise technique and musical rhythm will surprise you. I'm just, I'm just sort of dancing, you know, with my heart to the music and with pain in my hands. Until next time, thank you for watching.